Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. So we're on the finally made it to the last video of chapter seven. It feels like chapter seven dragged on forever because we had to do exa example problems and things like that in it. But we finally got to physical gene mapping. So up until now we talked about genetic mapping, which used the recombination frequencies, but we don't use that today. There are other techniques to figure this out. And so physical gene mapping, we're gonna go over three ways today. So again, genetic, Mapping uses recombination frequencies. This one tracks down chromosomal regions where genes are found. So there are modern techniques to do this, but think about back then. We're trying to find a gene on, you know, say chromosome five that's responsible for something. How do we know where on chromosome five it is, or is it on chromosome five? Yeah, you can do a genetic map and look at recombination frequencies from one gene to the other, but you don't know the chromosome number all the time unless it's a sex linked gene. So this helps you figure out the chromosome number and the region on that particular chromosome. So you can combine uh, genetic mapping with physical gene mapping and start getting a really good picture of what this looks like. And we'll talk about a technique today that does this much better. So remember, this is based on then eventually gets based on nucleotide base pair sequence away from each other. So the first one I want to talk about is called somatic cell hybridization. So this one fuses two cells from different species. So the typical example here is we have a, a human fibroblast cell. Here's a nucleus. And we fuse it with a mouse fibroblast cell. When we fuse these together, this, so this is, you know, you, this is possible. You can fuse two cells from two different species. Now you form a new cell and the nu a new nucleus forms here and random chromosomes are selected from each one, completely random. So this hybrid is known as a heterokaryon. And as I said, some of these heterokaryon nuclei fuse. It doesn't happen to every single one, so then you only select the ones that had the fusion. And then when that fusion happens, different chromosomes are lost from one cell to the next, which means you can screen for the protein product. So if you're looking for a particular you know, enzyme or protein being produced in human chromosome 5, or you think that's where it is, you fuse it to the mouse and the mouse doesn't have that particular gene or enzyme present on their chromosome five. You then fuse it with the nuclei, you get chromosome five that's absent and that g protein shouldn't be present. So then you would grow these on a plate here and then you would have you know random cultures that might appear and express that certain protein. So again, you screen for the product, which is the protein. And yeah, so that's somatic cell hybridization. Now, the best way to understand this is by looking at example data. So here we have each of these dots would be a different cell line. So we have cell line A, B, C, D, and E. You then are looking at the enzyme or protein present. That's either you know negative or positive. Then here, it's not, oh, that uh, the line disappear here. These are human chromosome present. So this one's only focused on the human chromosome and it's looking at chromosome one, four, 16, 20, and the X chromosome. So here in cell line A, chromosome one, human chromosome one, four, 16, and 20 were present, but X was not present. And in this one, the enzyme was not present. That's might be a good start to this. So no enzyme, no X chromosome. Down here, we have the enzyme and we have the X chromosome, but we also have chromosome 20. But here where we have chromosome 20, oop, not pink, <laughs> I meant to pick red. Here where we have chromosome 20, we should have the enzyme if it's on chromosome 20, but it's not. Let's just look at the rest of the data to confirm. So enzyme present, chromosome present. Again, 20 is present again in this one. You can get the same ones. Uh, again, it's random. Enzyme present, 20, or X is present. But then here, 20 is not present, which further solidifies that 20 does not have the chromosome. And then here, 4 and 16 are present, but we're not really too focused on them now. And then down here, if the enzyme is absent, we should not have chromosome X. We don't have chromosome X. So with this data, we can, you know, our conclusion is that most likely the enzyme we're thinking of or trying to isolate here is found on chromosome X. So that's what you can get from this. So that's pretty cool. I mean, I think it's neat, especially, you know, we're forming these little hybrids here and then we're just screening for the products. Now, the next thing that could be done is called deletion mapping. 
Uh, so this one's a little different. Uh, so deletion mapping here, it looks, if, say we're looking at chromosome X, it specifies whether a certain region has been deleted or not. So chromosome deletions can naturally occur at a very low frequency, and you can use that and see it in a karyotype to do this deletion mapping. So the best way to explain this is by drawing out an example. So I'll draw out this example and then go through it. And here we are, I have it all set up. Uh, so let's look at what's, let me explain what I just drew here. So pretty much deletion mapping again, you're looking at when a region is deleted. So right here is a deletion in this cross. So when you do this cross with these two parents, and so these are the, this is the parent generation and this is the F1 generation down here. So when we're looking at this parent generation, so right there again is the deletion, we'll highlight that in red, we can map out where that goes. In this case, the deletion included the gene of interest. So here, you know, this is, you know, AA mutant. And then this one here is just A plus wild type. But from the karyotype, you know, it's missing that gene sequence, but you just know the phenotype is wild type. You don't, you're not sure whether it's there or not, whether gene A is located within the deletion. You can figure it out by looking at the F1 generation then. So if you look at the gametes and the Punnett square, what this one would result in, this one would be A plus A wild type. This one would be A mutant. Which means because of this deletion, half of the offspring display the mutant phenotype. And that's if the gene is within the deletion region. So now let's look at an example over here where the deletion, so same example, it's just the deletion is on a different part of this chromosome that doesn't include gene A. So again, we have the AA mutant. And now we have A plus wild type. So phenotypically, this is the same cross. Now, what are these progeny? You know, we're used to doing this cross as you know, two true breeding parents in our minds make all heterozygous offspring. So here, A plus A, wild type. And this one's also A plus A wild type. So if this deletion happens, all will display heterozygous wild type. So how you can use this information now is, or how not you, but they use this information. They do these crosses until they find the one where half display the mutant phenotype. When they find this cross where it should be a typical wild type, and they find the mutants there, they know that gene was within that deletion region. So kind of cool how you can do this deletion mapping. I wanted to draw this out here to explain it a little better. So another technique here, and we're not gonna get into too much detail because we haven't gotten to the molecular biology portion of this course yet, but you can do molecular analysis. Again, this will be covered later. So newer molecular techniques allow better precision for determining exact location down to the base pair sequence of a gene on a chromosome. If you know different gene sequences within that gene, you can easily figure out where it is, you can label it and so forth. Um, but we'll get to that later in this series or in the semester. I just wanted to mention that there. Now, another thing I want to talk about is how we display these genetic maps. You know, when we do recombination frequencies, you have A, B, C, and then you write map units like that. But that's not how you might see these if you're reading about a particular gene and where it's located. So I wanted to go over these. These are called ideograms and uses the ISCN mapping system. And ISCN is the International System for Cytogenetic Nomenclature. So how does this work then? So this is an example of how you would see an image depicting gene locations on a particular chromosome. So the regions are based on staining. So you can stain the region and one stain is called a Giemsa stain, uh, which stains, I think, um, either AT or GC rich regions and makes them a darker color. So again, based on staining. And so that's typically how these are expressed. So darker regions, lighter regions, again, uh, Giemsa is the stain here. So how do we, again, how do we read these? So, you know, we're looking at, you know, a chromosome here. We have the centromere right here. So as we go away from the centromere, what happens to the numbers? So 11.2, 11.3, 11.4, 11.5, 11.6, 11.7, 11.8, 11.9, 11.10, 11.11, 11.12, 11.13, 11.14, 11.15, 11.16, 11.17, 11.18
21, 21, 22, 22, and then away, 12, 13, 21, 25, 28. So as you go further away from the centromere, the number increases with that distance. So that's step one here. Now let's see what else it says here. XP 11.22. So what does this all mean? So let's write it out. XP, let's do 11.3. So here, X is the chromosome. Now I know this one is X, but we would write chromosome number. So if this was a five, P 11.3, it'd be chromosome five. Now what's the P? If you remember way back when we talked about chromosome structure, there's a P arm and a Q arm. Remember P is petite. So here, this would be the P arm. And then down here, this would be the Q arm. So that's why all of these have Q and all of these have P. So this is chromosome arm. And then the 11.3 here, these are the regions and subregions within that particular part. So not um, don't quote me on this, but you could say something like the SRY gene, which is on the X chromosome, is in XP21.1. Then you know exactly the X chromosome. Well, it would be on the Y chromosome, not the SRY gene. I picked a horrible gene. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so that's not one you want to choose. Let's do uh, one for hemophilia, which is an X-linked recessive disorder, let's say it's on XP 21.1, then you know exactly where, you know, something like hemophilia A could be derived from if you're looking at that particular chromosome as an example. Um, so yes, that's being able to read these, being able to read these numbers. These aren't made up numbers here for when genes are being defined, but they help you know where they are. So that's all I wanted to go over today for the physical mapping section. And this fig, uh, finishes up chapter seven. So we went over a lot on chapter seven for physical gene mapping, linked genes, doing three point, two point test crosses and so forth. Next chapter, I believe we're getting into chromosome abnormalities. So, you know, things, how does um, Down syndrome happen, deletions, insertions, translocations, and all that fun stuff. But that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments and I hope you all, all have a great day and bye-bye.